Well, hello, everybody. This is a G Zero Media special live stream, Decision 2020. What just happened? The truth is, it's what is happening because we don't really know yet. As you all know, you've been following along, I'm sure, all night and all day, like all the rest of us did. And this is an election that was just filled with superlatives from the start, right? Highest voter turnout in a century, most polarized the nation has been since the Civil War, we've heard. And of course, most important for a number of reasons, regardless of what side of the aisle you're on. And right now, it's just a waiting game, particularly waiting on Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Arizona, and Nevada. And I'm joined today by an all-star panel for the next 30 minutes or so. We'll see how it goes. Ian Bremmer is the president of Eurasia Group and G Zero Media. Karen Atia, global opinion editor of the Washington Post. John Lieber is managing director for the US at Eurasia Group, guru of all things politics and policy. And Alex Clement is senior editor of G Zero's Signal newsletter and the creative mastermind behind Puppet Regime. Let's get started. I am so excited. We have so much to talk about. And obviously, I'll keep an eye. I've got multiple screens going here in case any news breaks. But Ian, let me start with you. Uh, we'd hate to say you told us so, but January 6th, 2020, top risks were published. Uh, we've never listed US domestic politics as our top risk, mainly because US institutions are among the world's strongest and most resilient this year. Those institutions will be tested in unprecedented ways. Is that what is that what's happening, and what is the danger right now? Yeah, that's what's happening, uh, and uh, great to be with all of you. Um, the uh, it, it certainly looks like Biden is going to win this thing, uh, but President Trump is not about to concede. In fact, he has announced that he's already won. And uh, you look at Republican senators, and uh, they're pretty quiet. They're not saying that uh, Trump has said anything wrong. Their president has said anything wrong, um, which sets us up um, to have a delegitimized outcome. There will be a president. The president will likely be Biden. And fully half of the country that cares about politics will believe that it was stolen away from them. And so the institutions of the United States, which have been eroding, incrementally for a while. Uh, you think about not just the election process, but the executive and the legitimacy of the executive, the legislature and the legitimacy of the legislature, the mainstream media and its legitimacy, social media and its legitimacy have all been eroding. And so, I mean, maybe the biggest picture thing you can say is that if you were to look at representative democracies that really function the role they're supposed to for their citizens, countries like Germany and Japan and the Nordics and Canada, you can't today actually include the United States in that group. Uh, it, the U.S. is nothing like China or Russia. It's not an authoritarian state. It's not about to become one, but it, it, has, it has experienced a significant amount of institutional erosion and slippage. And that means that the hangover from this election um, that is going to be experienced well beyond just how long it takes to get to inauguration and how divided it is. I, I, I think that it's going to make it much harder for the next president to effectively govern and much harder um, for anti-establishment trends in the United States uh, to be corralled and to orient towards uh, a sense of, uh, of civic belonging. The, all of those things, the United States heading in the wrong direction right now. This election is going to be very meaningful in that regard. Yeah, I mean, we just heard from President Trump saying, you know, we did win this election. We're going to fight these results regardless, essentially. And you can understand why there are some who would say that has authoritarian undertones to it. But you've been saying all along America's not really in danger of that. However, how do you think Republicans are going to react if this is super close, this goes to a court, he continues to contest this? Look, I think ultimately, and others will have stuff to say about this, um, once all of the legal efforts um, are exhausted, that the Republicans are going to get behind and accept whatever the final outcome is. But that doesn't mean that Trump will actually concede uh, the way that Gore, for example, conceded after the Supreme Court voted. Uh, Trump is going to have more control over the Republican Party, not less, given his comparative outperformance, uh, given what all of the polls had been saying heretofore. Um, and I also think that in social media, I mean, yes, today, Twitter has, you know, put some warning labels on some of Trump's tweets, 
but they're not stopping or limiting his influence on that platform. Facebook isn't either. And, you know, the victory speech that Trump gave yesterday was carried in full by so social media and the mainstream media. And, and this is a problem that's going to grow in the United States. Yeah, and John, let's talk a little bit about, about the Supreme Court and what the possibilities there could be. I mean, do you see a likelihood that, that this could go there and, and that they would, uh, how they would rule on it, I guess, if it did? It's possible. I mean, you, you have to have a, a case to bring. And the most likely case that President Trump has been making for a few weeks now is one against the late arriving mail ballots. Um, the predicate has been laid. The Supreme Court indicated that they would be willing to consider an argument that uh, the Pennsylvania state court decision to extend the deadline to accept mail ballots in Pennsylvania, uh, as long as there's no evidence they were mailed after the election, um, that the Supreme Court would be willing to overturn that. And the argument is that the legislature should be the one who sets these election deadlines Trump's ready to dispute all these later arri arriving mail ballots. In his press conference last night, he said that you know, we have to stop people from voting after the election, which I think was an oblique reference to these late arriving ballots. And maybe people are dropping them in the mail this morning. At least that's the allegation. Um, so that's probably the most likely path to the Supreme Court. There are, of course, others. If there's a close race in, in Wisconsin and there's a dispute, that could that's get them there. But I think that probably that first one is, is the most likely. Karen, when we talked on Monday, you said regardless of the outcome, this is going to say something about where America is right now. Um, we don't actually know the outcome, but we know how super close it is. So what does that say about America? Well, it says that uh, this is not a repudiation of Trump and Trumpism, that uh, while Biden still may be on track to have a political victory, it doesn't feel for a lot of people like this is quite the moral victory that we hope for. I think for a lot of people, even just for the sake of the institutions um, and for, for, for peace, really, we were hoping that there would be a clear and decisive result on um, today, right now. Um, the fact that that hasn't happened, I think, speaks to a, a lot of what... Um, we were afraid of it. I think all these all these factors come into play. The the attacks on the illegitimacy of our institutions. The fact that we even had to to question uh, the post office that the post office came under attack this year. That mail in ballots um, and the legitimacy of our elections came under attack this year. And the fact that we're sitting here and we're speaking, and we're not even sure about a concession from Trump. I in my in my time in covering elections in, in Africa, I'm thinking even of, of Ghana and even uh, the U.S. as, uh, as a, a world force that has always tried to promote some form of democracy to other, to other countries. One key tenet of that um, is the lecturing uh, often of leaders to say when they lose elections is to concede, to stand down. Um, this happened in, in Nigeria in, in 2015 when uh, Good Luck Jonathan was threatening to not concede to Muhammadu Buhari in those contested elections. And I remember the US saying, you, you need to respect democracy and you need to promise to step down and here we are. Um, and we can't even get that from, from President Trump or for the, from the GOP. Um, so I think that's, that's how I'm, I'm feeling is that yes, there, there's a path to political victory, but there is quite, uh, if, if the Dems were trying to position themselves as sort of the values voters, um, of this of this selection of values of of, of uh, kind of openness and, and unity and and repudiating racism and sexism, their message didn't convert as many people as we had hoped. Um, so that is very sobering, I think, right now. I want to talk a little bit about that and sort of what seems to be emerging as a, a, a new coalition or a growing coalition for the GOP. But first, uh, if you're playing uh, the home game, <laughs> you're probably seeing a poll on our site uh, or below your video if you're on a mobile player. And I do want to, there were a number of important issues that Americans were considering as we headed into last night. And I want to get a read from our viewers. The question is, what issue mattered most to you in this election, the choices are pandemic response, race and equality, the economy, or other. Ian, 
I'm curious. I mean, it seems hard to believe that pandemic wouldn't be more front and center than it really was. But when you looked at the exit polling last night, it was not number one for either party. Uh, what does that say to you? And who do you think that benefits politically? Yeah, um, I mean, I'm a little surprised the pandemic wasn't considered number one, given the timing. Uh, I mean, in Brazil, a few months ago, it was number one, but then the cases started to slip. Bolsonaro's approval rating went up. Uh, I mean, to the extent that Trump has been way behind um, in the last few weeks, in part, that's driven by the fact that most Americans think he has mishandled coronavirus, almost 10 million cases, almost 250,000 deaths, um, and uh, a, a government that has truly politicized this crisis. But Trump has consistently outperformed compared to Biden in terms of how you feel about the economy. And most Americans leaving the exit polls over the last night, uh, if, they, if, if they said the economy was the most important issue for them, they, they said that they were doing better than they were four years ago. And historically, you remember, it's the economy, stupid. Um, when people think the economy is doing well, they give the president credit, irrespective of how much the president deserves. In the same way that if you're mishandling coronavirus, you know, if it's going badly, whether it's your fault or not. I mean, one thing that is worth mentioning, Tony, is that if you look at uh, the France, if you look at the UK, if you look at Spain, if you look at the EU as a whole right now, it is not clear that the United States is doing worse in response to coronavirus than the EU. And so even though we see all of these things that Trump has done badly, it's not clear that that's actually led to meaningfully worse performance in the United States. So, I mean, what I think is happening is that you have two sets of Americans that are consuming two completely different sources of information. And there were an awful lot of people that felt like, you know what? Um, I, I'm being mistreated by a whole bunch of people. No one cares about my issues and I still have grievances. And that sense of grievance politics leads to much more radical and volatile outcomes. One of the reasons why Trump outperformed with Hispanics compared to in 2016 is I think a lot of anti-immigration sentiment among those that are already here and feel like no one's taking care of them, but we're letting more in. Those sorts of perspectives, which is what got you Brexit, you know, back in 2016, what got you the Gilets jaunes movement in France, what's led to so much instability in so many democracies around the world. I think we're experiencing that in the United States today to a greater degree than any advanced industrial democracy in the world. And I think that the 2020 elections are really showing that it's a punch in the face to anyone that thought that we were one and done with President Trump. Trump's probably gone as president. We are not one and done with Trumpism or with this sense of profound grievance and structural inequality inside the United States that plays across the entire political spectrum. Yeah, so our poll results are in. Um, I just want to share pandemic response came in first at 30% for our viewers with economy at 23 and race at 19, other issues 26%. Alex Clement, uh, to pick up on the point that Ian was just making about uh, inequality, I think it's interesting. We were, we were all sort of going back and forth this morning, even in our editorial meeting about uh, how important the economy was. And James Carville, you know, old adage seems true, except the economy and the markets are two different things. Unemployment is still incredibly high, right? Particularly among women, particularly among people of color. Why do you think that's been conflated? And what do you think that means? Well, I think when people say that the economy was the number one issue, there's two different, very different ways of looking at the economic crisis that we're in right now, right? For one set of people, the crisis is the result of a ham-fisted or catastrophically bad handling of the pandemic. But for other people, uh, it's the result of what they see as an overzealous response to the pandemic, right? The argument that the cure was worse than the disease appears to have swayed uh, a lot more people than 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 we thought it would. So, you know, just looking alone at the economy as the top issue 
can be understood very differently by very by by very you know by different people depending on their experience. How directly affected were they by a death or illness from COVID versus how directly affected were they by the lockdowns, by the quarantines, uh, and by the resulting economic downturn? Karen, it's hard to look at the divide between Democrats and Republicans that came out of that exit polling and look at where race and equality fell um, for each party and not see that there are two Americas, right? Yeah, or, or just really a, a, a multitude of Americas. Um, we haven't talked so, so much about the, the youth vote, right? And uh, the youth vote was actually a bit higher amongst um, people of color. And I think we can't completely discount the fact that, I mean, we had the largest uh, mass demonstrations, civil rights demonstrations in history this summer. So even here in, in Texas, and there's still ongoing, there are people who are still uh, protesting. So I think for a lot of young people, that really did motivate them to to go to the polls. Um, that being said, I mean, I'm, I'm joining you guys uh, from, from Texas, and I, I, I see it here. I mean, you can have a similar set of facts, right? And if we take the pandemic response, facts that yeah the pandemic isn't really going very well but i've heard from from people here in in, in texas friends family members who say uh well trump you know he he really helped things by shutting down uh it would have been so much worse if he didn't shut down travel from china uh i think we we should not also underestimate uh, a lot of these sort of alternative media sources, Epoch Times it comes to the top of mind for me here uh, in Texas, that um, have really gained a lot, uh, whether it's, it's followers uh, on, on Facebook who um, promote uh, a, a very you know, pro-Trump agenda, very um, you know, blaming, again, to, to a lot of people who, who read this uh, that I've talked to, um, they don't see the pandemic issue as, a, as an American failure response. They see it as like, well, this is all China's fault. Um, the way to deal with this is, is to deal with China. Uh, yeah, I think we are we are living in America in an America where there are two. There, what is common is the sense of alienation, is the sense of marginalization, um, is white grievance is white male grievance um and the politics of that and those who and, and the attraction i think of that is something that we we need to do a whole lot better of a job um on doing and i think also when it comes to even this idea of the latino vote there is no the latino vote votes in in um from those latinos in texas are going to be different than those uh, Cubans in Florida or Afro-Latinos in, in New York, um, I think we're seeing probably more of a divide between rural, urban, younger, old um, tax brackets, uh, those who feel quite comfortable with the way things have gone, who have not been affected by the pandemic versus those who are essential workers and who are um, largely coming from Black and, and, and Latino communities. And, and so the fact that there's no, or feels that way, right? That where is, is there any common ground to even build from and begin to heal from? I am not sure right now on Wednesday at 11.30 a.m. Eastern time. Um, no. Maybe I'll feel differently, but uh, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's sobering and it should be. Yeah, I mean, so there's so much in there to unpack, but I mean, I think the point about the media that you made is actually really interesting. There are more sources right now for people, more options than there than there were. I mean, now we have America, One America News Network, there's Newsmax, those got actually fairly substantial audience. I wanna ask John Lieber on the point of media, you know, a lot of the dissection of after 2016 was, you know, we all just missed rural America completely. We didn't understand where the heart of America was. We weren't listening to this voice of the sort of um, forgotten white working class person. Um, do you think that's true again? And how do you think the media looks right now um, this morning after? You, you know, um, look, the media has been this, missing the story of a huge segment of America for a really long time. So that's not new. It's not new to 2016. It's not new to 2020. Donald Trump's an amazing campaigner. 
The guy identified the exact votes he need, needed, the exact places he needed to go, and the exact places he needed to sh- people he needed to show up to have a fighting chance at this election where the polls showed him down by 10 points nationally. So, I mean, he did it in 2016. And you can blame the media, I guess. But I, I think that, you know, Trump is speaking to these, these, these voters in a way that the Democratic Party just isn't. And I think the two parties are starting to reflect this rural uh, base for the Republicans, this urban base for the Democrats who are living in very different worlds. The media uh, is in the same world as the Democrats, geographically, socially, from an educational perspective, and many other ways. And the Republicans are living in a very different place. And Trump went to that place and did exactly what he needed to do to make this an incredibly, to win in 2016 and make this an incredibly close election this time around. Yeah, John, I mean, there were, you know, nobody really was out there loudly predicting a total blue wave this time around. But I mean, you've got to be a little bit surprised, particularly when it comes to this waiting game we're playing with the Senate, the the seats lost in the House. Give us a sense of sort of where those stand right now. We haven't talked at all about Congress. The Senate looks like your Democrats maybe pick up one seat. So 53 seat majority from the Republicans goes to a 52 seat majority for the Republicans. Uh, There's still outstanding races uh, yet to be called in North Carolina, Michigan, and Maine, are, and Georgia. There's a special election in Georgia in January. And those are the, probably the places where the control of the government will hinge, um, the control of the Senate will hinge, but the Democrats have to outperform their current margins and win that uh, Georgia election if they want to have a majority. In the House, you know, the Democrats, the hand, race handicappers, handicappers and the Democrats thought they were going to pick up 10 to 15 seats. They lost seats. So this is just, I mean, the, the polling failure here, I think is gonna be one of the big stories of this election and just how hard it is for us to know things about our fellow citizens and about the world if our if polling just misses altogether. I mean, a lot of the, there is one prominent handicapper who's been saying for three months that this is a 85 to 90% election for Joe Biden. And Biden probably ends up winning this election. That's what it looks like today. He might not, the numbers in Arizona are, are going in a, uh, a, a funky direction right now, but you know, let's assume he does win. I mean, that was not a 90% victory. He squeaked out a win here. Um, and, and I think that's something that we're going to have to you know, work on. Ian, what do you think this means for the future of polling? That is not a unique sentiment right now. And you go to Twitter and see how many people are piling on Nate Silver right now. It's not a great morning for him. Um, you know, I, I do worry that uh, people have a bias uh, that is structural. It's not coming from the numbers. It's coming from their own individual filter. And that you don't, I mean, you, you can recognize four years ago, oh, okay, yeah, I didn't get it. I wasn't paying attention to all of those people in those flyover states that I don't really care about. But you're not actually spending any time with them. And when you do, you treat them as a science experiment. And meanwhile, there's been four years of Trump and he's been such a disaster that obviously everyone's going to figure that out. And so you haven't, it hasn't affected you. And you are the one that has to change. You are the problem. I mean, my last book uh, was called The Failure of Globalism, Us Versus Them, The Failure of Globalism. It was about people that I know, that I hang out with all over the world, yes, including me, that say, well, it's obvious that since globalization and free trade and open immigration is good for the global economy, then we should all support it. And that's so easy for those of us in the top 10, 1.1% to say, but for those that have not benefited in any way from those wins globally, why would they support it? Why would they keep supporting it? Why would they believe that more of the establishment is gonna make a difference for them? and? You know, I also think that the level of grievance, I'm not going to suggest that there is a structural shy Trump vote out there. But Karen mentioned this before. I mean, we know that there is structural racism in this country. We know that there is structural sexism in this country. And and, and if you're on the left, you may indulge in all sorts of banter with your friends, you may have those attitudes yourself, but you also know that it's wrong and you'd get hell for it if you did it publicly, you know it. And yet I see those same people engaging in the same kind of stereotyping against white, rural, underclass voters. We see it with Barat, 
right now. We see it in the mainstream media every day. I actually saw from a Boston Globe columnist, I shit you not, just a couple of days ago that showed a, a, a caravan of, um, of Trump flag waving um, uh, Jeeps and one of ISIS convoy of Toyota pickups. And this woman, Boston Globe columnist says, I can't tell the difference between these two things. Are you insane? I mean, how how is it remotely plausible that a person that would be considered part of the establishment would say something like that? And I have to tell you, I mean, as a personal Trump voter, if, and I'm not, but I'm saying if I were and I got a call from someone representing a media organization like that, I'd either hang up the phone and not answer or I would lie. But I, I, I don't think I would respond honestly if I felt like these people fundamentally uh, see me as other and no good and useless and joke and laugh about me. So, I mean, I think we have a very, very serious problem. And I think polling is a, is a part of that problem. Yeah, I mean, we only have a few minutes left, but this is fascinating. So I just want to keep you guys for a couple more minutes. And Karen, as a member of the mainstream media and an editor of of uh, one of our biggest, uh, most established newspapers, why don't, why don't you take that question as well, just for a beat? What is the media's responsibility here? Whew. This should be a massive indictment on the media, I think. Um, I think that in terms of, I, and I agree with Ian and, and some of the sentiments that we had earlier this year, and I've, I've said this for, for years, in terms of treating some of these, these forces by, um, and I'm talking about some of these forces of, of race and racism, um, with as if like these are just some kind of grotesque like spectacles, these curios, these... Uh, these uh, uh, race, you know, hustlers in many ways with cool haircuts. And if if we just expose people to how silly and racist and dumb they are, uh, then surely white people are going to get it and say that we don't want to go to back to America's factory settings, right, of, of racism and want to, to go forward. And now I'm seeing here all of those profiles, and I agree with Ian, all those profiles of Dumb, you know, stereotyping people as, as dumb redneck Trump supporters. And here we are. I think, you know, I, this is just pure speculation. I, I, this is just based on what I've seen that there is a bit of a, a backlash in some ways, people using here that I've seen using their backlash to, to hit back at, uh, at, at being called this. <laughs> um, to, it's kind of like this, let's show the libs type of, of sentiment. Um, and I think, I think for the media, I cannot, you know, particularly as a black woman, I cannot sit here and pretend that we have done a good job in reflecting accurately this country. And particularly when it comes to newsroom votes, I think now we're seeing the scrambling to try to figure out Latinos, what, why, que, como, you know, and there are so many populations that people have said for years we're going to be decisive for years um and and I, I hesitate to even use latino vote because again this is such a nuanced community this also has to do with latino evangelicals but the me media organizations that have not made investments in uh, bringing on these voices in investing in, in reporting in these communities. And I think that all the hand wringing that is being done uh, right now, I think a lack of an, in, ultimately, I think it just comes to a, a lack of investment and in really trying to get to know who we are, whether it's black people, black voters, Latino voters, uh, Trump voters, I think we can't underestimate, again, even the, the religious right, um, evangelicals, and again, that is even not a monolith. Um, I am just sitting here, um, and I'm a bit frustrated. I'm a bit uh, saddened, and I'm a bit, um, I think there are a lot of us who've been calling uh, calling out some of the, the, you know, taking for granted uh, that this democracy is something that people of course oh just of course people are gonna are, are gonna see our point of view easily right that is not 
the case. Trump went to these communities. Trump went to the Latino communities. Trump went inside, uh, 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 knew what he had to do. I question whether the, the, the Biden campaign, we're not even really talking about Biden's, he has weaknesses as a candidate. People, even if we're going to talk about likability, which we love to do when there's women candidates, people love Trump. People like Biden. People like, you know, Uncle Joe. But the, I, 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 I find that I can't discount the emotion of likability and, and, and love and devotion, almost like a, a, a religious sense of devotion to a, a particular figure and, and to a particular sense that he is going to liberate them from the things that have caused them grievance um, all this time. And, you know, I'm, 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 after I, we get off of this, I'm going to be really quite thinking a lot um, about how we, how do we even talk about who we are anymore? How do we, how do we change our, our media models to, to a, address this and what is our task now is it to heal is it to to ram through policy can you heal from policy you know i i, I don't know um we'll well, that's a last is, is, that's a last uh, oh, sorry john go ahead if you want to say something well i was just gonna say i mean another approach is like maybe it's impossible to speak this is one of the challenges of being a media organization in a big diverse country where there's a lot of polarization and people who don't want to hear what you have to say so maybe there's like you know the new yorker talk Talks to New Yorker, New York Times talks to lead educated Americans in, in cities largely. The Washington Post has its audience, and then Fox News has its audience. And it's really hard to talk to all those groups at the same time because people don't want to hear the same stuff and they aren't interested in the same thing. So, you know, I, there's no like this. We have a monolithic media controlled out of the cities that is doesn't need to be that way. And it's like there may just be a diversity of opinion and you can't beat everything to everybody in a diverse country like this. Yeah, I, that's. Fair point. <laughs> and uh, before right. we leave this conversation, I do want to just sort of touch a little bit on, Karen was talking a bit about sort of this is a how, what this means to us, sort of sort of what we're saying about us, but there's also sort of this notion of what we're projecting to the world. Alex Clement, I know, um, Signal, the G Zero newsletter, uh, did a pretty extensive project talking to, to journalists around the world about what this election meant to them and what its outcome could potentially mean to the nations that they cover um, or are from. Uh, will you tell us a little bit about that and, and what reactions you're seeing out there right now as this moment of limbo continues? Yeah, look, I mean, as, as much as the election is about kind of soul searching and trying to define what America is, you know, how we see it as Americans, it reverberates around the world, as you say. I mean, we are the world's largest economy, the world's most powerful military. So, you know, the election here uh, has, con you know, elections have consequences, as they say here, but also uh, abroad. And I think that was particularly true given just how starkly different the visions of America's role in the world are between Biden and Trump. You know, most of the time when you have a, a, a presidential election, the president, you know, the, the, the debate is really about domestic policy, right? Foreign policy has been more or less consensus over the past 30 or 40 years. That could not have been less true about this election. So people around the world were watching very closely. Um, and as you say, we spoke to, to journalists in 24 different countries around the world, who, local journalists, by the way, not foreign correspondents, to get a sense of what they were looking at. Um, and, you know, I think the, the, the journalist we spoke to from, from Ethiopia put it really nicely when he said, look, this is a referendum, not just for the United States, but for the world. What kind of country is the U.S. going to be in the world? Is it going to be an engaged country? Is it going to be, continue to want to be a global policeman or not? Is it going to lead initiatives on climate? Um, what kind of example, this is to Karen's point earlier, the U.S. has been lecturing other countries for decades about how to be a democracy. When other countries look at our electoral system and the, the kind of polarization and the uncertainty and Trump himself refusing to concede, well, not refusing to concede, we'll see if he does that, but sort of openly injecting himself into the election saying, stop counting the votes. That's a message that, that carries far and wide uh, for a number of countries around the world. Um, one, one journalist we spoke to from South Africa said, hey, you know, th the way that the US behaves, if it pulls back from being an advocate for at least you know, paying lip service to certain democratic norms, it becomes what he called open season uh, for others to, beha to behave the same way. So other countries around the world are looking at some specific things. What is the U.S. going to do on immigration policy, on trade policy, on security? But there's this much bigger thing, which is what is the U.S. 
How does it, what is its role in the world and what is the example that it sets? And even if Biden squeaks this thing out, I think for all the reasons that we've been discussing, uh, the world can see that American society no longer has a consensus on that. Um, and that, the, that, the, that, that Trumpism, the idea that the US should play a more limited role in the world, be more inward looking, look out for self more than for other countries. Uh, that's going to be with us for a while. And I think even if Biden squeaks this out, other countries are going to have to uh, have to adjust, whether it's the Europeans looking at the alliances, Japan looking at the alliances, the South Koreans, everybody is going to have to live in a world where Trumpism is an important part of US foreign policy, even if Trump is not the president. So, so I want to jump Ian, in for a second here. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I, I think I agree with that. Uh, but I, I also think that there are two big areas globally where the world is looking for the United States right now. And one, the US is probably gonna fail on and the other United States is probably gonna succeed on. And I, I'm presuming that Biden is going to be the next president, by the way. Um, again, it's hardly 100%, but it's certainly much more likely than not. Um, assuming that Biden wins and it is not a democratic Senate, the ability of the United States to drive meaningful change in climate policy is very, very constrained. And that's happening while the Europeans are driving it. The Japanese are finally driving it under Suga. The Chinese are stepping up. So the Americans will really be an outlier in one of the most important issues, especially for young people all around the world. And that's gonna be much less aligned, much more G0. On the other hand, the single thing that Biden is going to matter most at in terms of change of trajectory, and that's even true with a Republican Senate, is coronavirus. I don't think we've talked about coronavirus yet on this stream, which is kind of astonishing given it's by far the most important issue for the United States and globally before the election and after the election. Absolutely, right? And, and Biden will ensure the U.S. is still a part of the World Health Organization. Biden will engage the United States in COVAX in terms of vaccine development, coordination, and distribution. Globally, the U.S. is the world's largest economy. The U.S. will also lead coronavirus with doctors, scientists. Who would have thunk it? Now, that doesn't mean you get a nationwide mass mandate. It's a federal system, after all. It doesn't mean that the Americans are suddenly going to be great at handling coronavirus because the Europeans, Lord knows, certainly have not been. But it does change the way we think about the United States in response to the worst crisis of our lives. And it aligns the American leadership more with that of every other civilized nation in the world. And I think that's important. Yeah, and before we close, um, I did want to just take a moment to shout out to Alex Clement, who, as many of you know, is uh, the sort of creative genius behind Puppet Regime. Um, last night, he did a little bit of a takeover of our uh, G Zero feed in the early hours before things were getting super tense um, with some Puppet uh, videos around world leaders reacting to uh, results as they were coming in. Let's just take a quick look at one of them. Great Satan is great Satan, no matter how you slice it. But between these two devils, I really need Joe to win. Life is too hard without that Iran deal. So let's go Pennsylvania. There, isn't there a Lebanon in Pennsylvania? Guys, we must have some influence in Pennsylvania. There is a Lebanon there. I mean, I don't know how you come up with it, but so are the who are the puppets rooting for, Alex Clement? The stuff writes itself these days. I mean, come on. Uh, you know, we uh, we uh, we've actually had a couple of uh, of episodes where we wrote some crazy stuff that actually then like ended up happening a few weeks later. We had to get a couple of, I guess, a year and a half ago where Trump and Kim Jong Un were comparing the size of their nuclear buttons. We wrote the skit put it out and then like two days later, Trump and Kim Jong-un were screaming at each other on Twitter or whatever it was about who had a bigger nuclear button. So, so we get a lot of requests to write things that people want to happen. Um, look, I think one big question that we've, that we've been talking about is if Trump goes, I mean, you know, there's a lot, there's, the, the, uh, if Biden wins, is, political, is, the, is the industry of political satire and comedy that's grown up around this outsized figure of Trump, what happens to that? Um, you know, he's a unique figure in being just like 
writing his, I mean, he's, you know, buffoonish, kind of clownish, erratic, uh, dangerous in a way. He writes his own, uh, his own lines for Puppet Regime practically. In a post-Trump world, there'll be a lot of great things about it. One thing we got to figure out is like how we still do comedy in that world, because Biden is not as humorous a character uh, or as easily uh, lampoonable a character oh, as Trump. I mean, oh, we can do yeah. it. There are lots of other world leaders. Well. <laughs> I can think a lot. He's, 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 Uncle Joe. Been been so stru structural bias can come in. The structural yeah. bias against uh, him being being lampoonable. All right, I'll I'll, I'll come up yeah. with something. I promise you. Oh, okay, oh yeah, you, um, you, might, you might have to. You might have to if Ian Bremmer's prediction is correct. And uh, <laughs> on that note, uh, I want to thank you all for, for being here. And thank you so much for spending time with us. And Ian, John, Alex Clement. Uh, I want to thank everybody out there who's watching this uh, special G Zero Media live stream. You can find more of our coverage at gzeromedia.com. And of course, sign up for our global affairs newsletter, Signal. For all of us here at G Zero, I'm Tony Masillis, and we will see you very soon.